Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannock here with fellow panelist Christopher Zender. Today we discuss marriage and the family. Our welcome guest is Perry Cahal of the Pontifical College Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio. He is the academic dean of the School of Theology and professor of historical theology. Dean Cahill is the author of Living the Mystery of Marriage, Building Your Sacramental Life Together. That's from Hillenbrand Books, 2020. A book whose primary audience is engaged in newly married couples and also uh, the Mystery of Marriage, A Theology of the Body and the Sacrament. Again, Hillenbrand Books, 2016. That's a book written for use in seminaries and universities. As always, let's begin in prayer. <laughs> Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and never rejoice in this consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Perry, if we may call you that, uh, could, could you please tell us a bit about yourself and your family? Uh, sure. I, um, I grew up in uh, Southern Ohio, Cincinnati area, went away to school in North Carolina. Uh, we've got my uh, MA and PhD in theology at St. Louis University. Uh, taught for uh, four years at Ohio Dominican University across town in Columbus, and then after four years, uh, was hired by the Josephinum, and I've been here now for, uh, this is my 18th year. Uh, I was eight years as a faculty member before becoming dean, and now this is my 10th year in the dean's office. Uh, I'm happily married for, it'll be 22 years in October, to my wife, Marissa, who also, uh, she has a, a PhD in clinical psychology. She, she teaches as an adjunct at the Josephinum every spring, a course in psychology to the guys. And I have two kids, a son who's a junior in college and a daughter who's a senior in high school this year. So that's a little bit about me and my family. Jim, you're muted. Sorry, I uh, had to mute and unmute. Uh, th thanks for that, Perry. What's the, the history of Pontifical Josephinum College? I'll try to give you the 60-second version. Um, so the Josephinum was founded by a German immigrant. His name was uh, Monsignor Joseph Jessing. Uh, he himself did his seminary at, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, where there was a large German population. He ended up coming to Columbus, and he founded an orphanage up here for German, uh, German boys. And uh, somewhere along the way, as the, some of the orphans grew older, uh, a few of them expressed a desire to study for the priesthood. So he, uh, he founded a seminary, and I think he founded it in, in 1888, I believe, and then four years later, he petitioned uh, Pope Leo XIII in Rome uh, for the pontifical status. Um, that means that the, uh, the chancellor of the board of the, of the Josephinum is uh, the apostolic nuncio to the United States. So there's the, the uh, if you will, authority chain goes through the nuncio uh, to the Holy See. So... Uh, Everybody thinks he probably did it because at the time there was a, an Irish bishop uh, in charge of Columbus, and he probably didn't want his seminary to be overseen by an Irish bishop. So he took it out of his hands by petitioning for the pontifical status, and Pope Leo granted it. Um, so it's been operating as a seminary since 1888, pontifical since 1892. Thanks for, for that background. One, one more background question. How did you uh, come to teach at the Josephinum and, and then move on to be a dean, although you haven't given up the teaching? No, no. I, uh, in fact, one of my requirements for 
when I was asked to be dean was that I'd be able to teach as much as possible. Uh, so I still am in the classroom. Um, well, I, the answer to your question in short is God's providence. Um, when I received my graduate degree uh, from St. Louis University, I envisioned getting a, a job in a small liberal arts college, a Catholic college, and you know, teaching there for the rest of my life. And um, that's looked like how it was going to be. My first job was at Ohio Dominican. And then um, the dean at the Josephinum at the time, the academic dean at the Josephinum, uh, knew one of my graduate school uh, professors. And uh, my, that professor had told me to come see uh, the dean when I got in town. I did. And then after I was at the Ohio Dominican for two years, the dean called me and said, hey, we need somebody to teach a couple courses. Would you be interested? I said, sure. Taught, uh, adjuncted for a couple of years. And then they um, offered me a full time position. And uh, after discerning it for a bit with my wife, said, well, OK, this is the door God's opening. And I've been here for 18 years. Very good. Christopher, you want to carry us forward? Yeah, um, maybe a little bit more on the history, because uh, I, I knew a priest in California. He was, we, we, lived, we lived in Kern County, which is the mountains in the desert. And he was the, um, he was the circuit priest for many years in the area. And uh, he died at the, almost the age of 101, oh, wow. Monsignor Francis Pointec. And he attended the Josephina. He said it was, in those days, you had to speak German and Latin. Uh, I, I take it that's not a requirement anymore. No, not anymore, but he is correct. When, uh, when Joseph Jesse founded it, it was founded precisely to serve uh, German students, German immigrants. So uh, for many years, German was a, a prerequisite to being admitted. And then over the years, the Josephine was kind of, I, I I would say modified its mission, you know, from um, from serving just the German immigrant population to serving um, the larger nation. It's a, we're a national seminary, so we're not we don't belong to the diocese of Columbus. Uh, we're an independent seminary that draws from different different dioceses, and uh, most recently, you know, the, the emphasis has been on his, ministering to Hispanic immigrants, and the Josephinum has offerings that help guys do that too. So shift, but I still think consistent with the original founding vision of Father Jessing. But there's one funny story about that. And I have seen the original admissions materials. And um, there, there was a line in there that said, the infernal game of baseball shall not be played on the Josephinum's campus <laughs> because the Germans hated this American game. And not <laughs> it probably wasn't 15 years after his death, there were four different baseball diamonds on the grounds of the Josephinum. <laughs> I was also told that, um, in, in, at least the, maybe in the, 19th, in the 1930s, the seminarians actually worked in Potato Field across the street from the... Yeah, uh, they, did, they had a full-fledged garden. Um, I do know those stories, and I've seen some pictures. So there's, the Josephine used to own a lot of property that's been sold off over the years, but there's still a good amount of acreage around here. And the students did uh, grow a garden for, to, uh, to raise their food that they ate in the cafeteria. So there was even some livestock, I understand, like you know, some goats, some sheep. So, yeah, we don't have our seminarians do that anymore, although maybe it would be a good idea. <laughs> maybe, maybe you need another German at the head of it to get them to do that's, that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, maybe we can move on um, your work on, on marriage. Um, you've sure. written two books on marriage. Why? Why? It's probably fairly obvious, but what moved you to do that, say, instead of, um, I don't know, the, the Trinity or Providence or something of that sort? Yeah, I, again, I think the short answer is God's providence. When I was in, um, when I was in grad school, uh, my dissertation topic was actually St. Augustine's uh, theology of marriage and its connection to his Trinitarian theology. And um, I published a few articles spinning off of that dissertation and then just over the years, was just drawn more and more um, to teaching and writing about marriage. It's When I taught at Ohio Dominican, I taught a course there every year called the Theology of Marriage, and that course was always maxed out with a waiting list. Um, at that point in, in time in our culture, I mean, kids, and I still think this is the case, young people really are desirous of love that lasts. You know, they, they want true love. And when this course was offered on marriage, they just flocked to it. 
And um, it was a very edifying experience teaching that course. And then I came over to the Josephinum and uh, was asked to teach a course on marriage and have been since I arrived here. And just over the years, it, uh, I, d- I had developed enough notes and done enough reading. I thought, you know, maybe one of these days I'll write a book. And I was, uh, again, as Providence would have it, I was asked to teach a course as a visiting professor at the Liturgical Institute at Mundelein Seminary in Chicago and uh, met the editor-in-chief of Hill and Brand Books one day. And he said, uh, he said, you know, um, he said, you're here teaching this course on marriage. He said, would you be interested in writing a book for us? Because we're doing this series on the sacraments, each of the sacraments. And I said, I- actually, I would. Um, so one thing led to another and two books came out of it. Interesting. It's funny you bring up St. Augustine. I, one of my daughters uh, read St. Augustine's treatise on the good of marriage. Mm-hmm. And her impression was at the end of it that he didn't see much good in it. You know, that was part of my uh, interest in it in graduate school is that Augustine has a fairly uh, bad rap, you know, when it comes to his vision of marriage. And some of that's deserved. I'm not going to lie. Um, but uh, if, if people, if you pay attention to not only that work, but some of the other works he wrote, he actually has a much more positive vision than people give him credit for. It's because interesting as uh, Pius XI seemed to think so too. Yeah, the whole, the whole encyclical that Pius XI wrote, Casti Canubii, um, on chaste marriage, that the whole thing is structured around Augustine's three goods of marriage that he identifies in that work that you mentioned yeah. good, on the good of marriage. So, yeah. Well, let, let me uh, cut to the contemporary chase. Okay. Uh, is marriage a social construct? Uh, no, <laughs> that's the short answer. It's uh. Well, then what is it? What is it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So uh, marriage is is a created reality. You know, it's uh, it's exists in nature and it's a created reality created by you know God Himself. Um, it's not something that sprung out of uh, some type of human idea. It certainly springs out of natural human desires, which God's, God embeds in our hearts. But, you know, from the very first chapters of Genesis, we, un, we know God creates marriage as he creates man, male and female and calls them to become one. Uh, and so it's, its origin is with God. And it's, and it's the, uh, if, if, if people ask me, and, and, and I've given talks to engaged couples over the years, and I said, you know, if, if you ask, well, why did God create marriage? The, the purpose is because it's supposed to be a living sign of his love for us. You know, it, the whole plan of salvation can be read in terms of, a, a, of a, a, roman- a romance, right? I mean, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, there's the beginning you have the God instituting marriage with Adam and Eve. The end of the Bible ends with a marriage, the wedding feast of the Lamb, when Christ, Christ weds his, himself to his church for all eternity. And everything in the middle is this huge love story with God wooing humanity into his love. He seeks to marry us. He seeks to wed himself to us. And from the dawn of time, marriage exists because God wants there to be this living reminder of how much he loves us, how intensely and how intimately he wants to unite himself to us. So in short, marriage, you know, to your question, you know, is marriage a social construct? No, it's a created reality, and it has sign value. It's a, it's a sacrament from the beginning, and Christ raises it to the level of a grace-giving sign. You know, when in, with his coming among us. That is very well put. Sad to say, in, in Los Angeles, where I sort of live, uh, most discussion of marriage is in terms of so-called homosexual marriage. And I think most of the national focus on marriage, uh, at least since Oberfell, has been on homosexual marriage. But now I wonder, isn't that a a contradiction in terms, homosexual marriage? Yeah, it really is. Um, You know, for marriage to exist, you know, as God created it, you know, it's, it's, I think the, the place to begin here is to, to ask, you know, what makes marriage unique, you know, and what makes married love unique among all the types of love that we can experience as human persons. You know, we can experience love of friendship, love of affection, paternal love, you know, filial love. Well, what makes married love unique 
And married love is unique because it possesses, you know, basically four qualities. It's a free gift of self. You know, and again, the, all of this image is God's love for us. He gives himself to us freely and he expects a free gift in return. That's this mutual self-donation of God to us and us to God. Is, that's what the essence of a covenant, the mutual self-donation of persons. So in marriage, the husband and the wife donate themselves to each other in love freely. You can't force somebody to give a free gift of themselves. It's faithful, right? It's exclusive just between the spouses, right? And God is ever faithful to his spouse, us, the church. Um, it's, uh, for, it's forever or permanent, right? Um, it's this gift of self that cannot be revoked. And the most distinctive quality of married love, of the marital covenant, is that it's meant to bear fruit, right? Of all loves that we can experience in the world, that's the most identifying unique feature of married love, you know, that married couples can express their love to each other in a certain way. And nine months later, you may have to give that expression of love a name, right? So those four qualities define the essence of marriage, free, faithful, you know, permanent, fruitful. And two men and two women cannot, by definition, share that type of love with each other. There is not the complementarity necessary to share that type of love. So um, homosexual marriage really is um, a contradiction in terms. You know, it's that you, to, in, or, for, in order for a couple to come together and become one flesh, right, and to experience those qualities of married love, there has to be one man and one woman. And uh, as a, again, that's the created institution that God put in place from the dawn of time. In everyday conversations, Use that background sound. It's my computer overheating. <laughs> in, in every uh, every ordinary everyday situation in which uh, homosexual marriage is discussed, uh, since uh, it is a contradiction in terms, how would you suggest that we refer to it? The, the reality of, of now what's called homosexual marriages, you know, I suppose you could call them homosexual relationships, you know, um, unions of some sort, uh, but they can't be marriage. And the, I think what, what's behind the whole phenomenon of even accepting homosexual unions or relationships as marriages is, a, is, a, for, is an amnesia of what marriage is, you know, with all those qualities that I think we've come to a point in our cultural degeneration, if, if you will, that um, people think marriage is just a relationship of convenience, you know, and that it's about the mutual satisfaction of desires for the couple and for the individuals in that relationship. There's not the understanding, which used to be there in our culture, that marriage is a profoundly social institution and has ramifications beyond just me and my spouse, right? That, that from, for centuries, you know, societies have, have governed how people enter into marital unions because there's the recognition that that union can offer something to the society that no other relationship can, namely more citizens. But when we come to the point where marriage is just seen as a relationship of mutual convenience and mutual self-satisfaction without reference to children, right, then it's a legitimate question to ask if I'm a gay man living with my lover, you know, and I have a, a heterosexual couple across the street who's married, right, but they've told me that they permanently sterilize themselves. They never intend to have children from the start. It's a legitimate question for me to ask as a gay man, well, why can't I have, why can't what I have with my lover be considered what they have? Mm -hmm. So that's, it's behind the whole acceptance of homosexual marriage is this, the, the forgetfulness or the, or the rejection of certain of the goods, right? Certain of the, the key qualities of, of married love, in particular children. I know you're <clears throat> well aware of this, and perhaps more aware of it than I am. <clears throat> Excuse me, but your position, which is my position, which is Christopher's position, which is the church's position, is strikingly at odds with uh, the zeitgeist. For example, here in Los Angeles, the annual uh, gay pride 
parade. It has over 100,000 people in it. And on this program, we've had a lot of people that in various ways present positions that are radical in the eyes of this world. Uh, but our position, your position, the church's position on marriage and its theological framework is as radical as anything could be. Uh, here in Los Angeles, no one in public office would speak the way you're speaking. And very <clears throat> impossible were someone to speak that way. Uh, the newspapers would be uh, uh, excoriating him or her. Uh, what's your take on all of this? I mean, it's one thing to be in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. It's one thing to live where Christopher Zender lives, but suppose you're in a, a major metropolis. Well, you, you might be surprised to know that I think it was it was no more than five years ago, Columbus was rated uh, as the most gay-friendly city in the country. So we have a, a huge you know, population of, of uh, people who are professively homosexual, and uh, we have our own gay pride parade here every year. Um, but I think in response to your question, um, I, I think the, the whole, the reason why, you know, homosexual relationships um, have become more accepted, and now we've gone to the point of transgenderism and, and beyond, um, is because of what I think John Paul II mentions in Veritatis Splendor, his encyclical on uh, moral morality and uh, teaching morality in the church. But he, sa he says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but at a certain point in that encyclical, he says that uh, the many, uh, if not most, of the, the, the modern world's ills are due to a misunderstanding of freedom and that what the church needs to do is evangelize the concept of freedom and so his point is that you know when the the the, the uh, distorted vision of freedom that our culture uh, operates with is freedom as the ability to do whatever i want whenever i want however i want even if that means somehow uh recreating my own nature it really means you're you making myself my own God. You know, um, it goes right back to this, the opening story in Genesis in Genesis three, where Adam and Eve, you know, and with that great symbolic uh, vision of plucking this tree, fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil have made this decision to, dis to create their own moral universe without reference to God. And that's, the, uh, that's the, the counterfeit vision of freedom that the evil one, you know, enticed them to believe. And when that, take, that vision of freedom, this, you know, radical, autonomous freedom takes hold in a culture, you know, then, well, okay, uh, for you to tell me that I can't sexually love somebody that I want to love, well, then that's an impingement upon or a barrier to me expressing my freedom. Instead of understanding freedom as not the ability to do whatever I want, but the ability to abide in the truth, right? And that only the truth sets us free. Jesus tells us that in John Gospel, John's Gospel, chapter 8. Right. The truth will set you free. Um, focus on, on freedom and how that's the, the core issue. Uh, seems to me to be right on. I've mentioned before that the editorial board of the Los Angeles Times in its position paper cites freedom yeah. without any gloss as its first and foremost value, first and foremost value. Uh, and of course, what they mean is, is negative freedom, absence of restrictions. Well, ironically, they're willing to restrict any number of uh, other views. Uh, let me push you a little bit farther here, and sure. then Christopher needs to, to take over. Uh, when you talk about love and uh, a homosexual person talking about uh, the love <coughs> of a same-sex union, 
we really don't even want to call that love, do we? Because love is wanting the good of another and working steadily to realize that good. But such a union is, is a counterfeit. It's not a good. So if we put all our cards on the table, and what a lame metaphor that is, if we're utterly frank, we don't want to call that love. I mean, I remember when a pastor here uh, referred to in a, an, observance, an observance of the 40th uh, day of the death of a homosexual member of a, a homosexual couple referred to his lover. And, and I, I thought, well, his sexual partner, perhaps, but lovers are someone, some, a lover is someone who loves, but that sort of love, in quotes, really isn't love, is it? Yeah, I think these are, these are great questions. I, I want to preface what I'm about to say by, by any, you know, anyone who listens to this interview should understand that you know, the church, everybody in the church should have real love and compassion for people struggling with same-sex attraction. You know, uh, in a fallen world, we all deal with our own you know, uh, desires that are not ordered properly. Right? And we have to somehow, if, and there's only two choices in this life. Either we master our desires or they master us. And if they master us, we become slaves to our own desires. And we all have desires that tend to, you know, get out of control or not be properly oriented. And same-sex same desire, same-sex attraction, I think, is a particularly difficult cross to bear. Um, and we all in the church, I think, should be, you know, truly loving these people. As you say, the essence of love is willing the good of the other to help them understand that by acting out on this desire, which is, you know, not properly ordered uh, in the sexual realm, that, that by acting out of it, on it, it's not going to bring happiness. Because it, can't ever, it cannot ever realize what it seeks, which is true intimacy and union and a communion between persons. And that body-soul union between persons is, is only possible on the sexual level, right, between a man and a woman. Any other attempt to, ha to have that type of union with somebody of the same sex is, is always and everywhere going to be frustrated. Um, and it's not going to do them any good. But more directly to your question, um, there are two things I wanted to mention. You, you mentioned, you know, an understanding of freedom without restrictions. I, I'm, I'm not sure that we want to talk about freedom, restrictions on freedom. We just need to understand freedom properly, that freedom is the ability to live in accord with the, the nature that God has given me, right? So if, I, if true freedom is living in accord with the truth about my person that comes from Almighty God. So if I, you know, I may have the desire to fly, you know, and crawl up to the steeple of the Josephinum and jump off and flap my arms as if they're wings. But that desire is self-destructive because it's not in, in accord with the type of being that God has made me to be, right? But if we live in accord with the nature that God has given us, endowed us with, as human persons made male and female in his image, then, you know, we're on the road to happiness. And it's not that there are restrictions there. It's just we're acting in accord with the truth of our nature, with the truth of our being. Right, so that's one comment. The other one, to your, directly to your comment about love and homosexual unions, um, I, I think that our culture is doing an incredible disservice to everybody, but especially young people. And I see this all the time. This, the subtle and not so subtle message that's being sent is that you can't really love somebody unless you have sex with them. And it conflates all different types of attraction with sexual attraction. So we have young people in high school age, for instance, you know, thinking that well, because I'm intellectually attracted to somebody of the same sex or even emotionally attracted to somebody of the same sex, like, well, I must be, you know, gay or bisexual or, and then I'm encouraged to act out on this. And no, we need to make distinctions. You know, you can have, and there are distinctions between different types of love, you know, sexual, you know, romantic, er eros, erotic love, married love can only be shared between a man and a woman, but you can have deep friendship love between to people of the same gender, right? Um, I mean, I love, I have many male friends, I love them dearly, right? But I don't have to have sex with them to love them. I love my brother and my father dearly, right? But I don't have to have sex with them to love them, 
you know, we, we, everything has been flattened out and, and, is, and I think there's an intentional agenda to confuse young people to say that all types of attraction and all types of love must be expressed in sexual activity. And that's just false. That leaves, that's a road to ruin. Is, is that a, a sufficient answer to your question? It certainly is, and, and I much appreciate it. I so two men and two women can, you know, who even experience same-sex attraction can have a really, a, a real, true, virtuous friendship, but they need not have sex with each other. Yes, I think one of the, one of the uh, results of what we might call a, a homosexualized culture is that uh, same-sex friendships are put in jeopardy. Yes, uh, I agree. With you. A sense of suspicion that develops. I agree with you. Yes. Well, well, I'm sure Christopher has much to add. Christopher. Yeah, I, I, my question has to do, and this will be in a preface, what I'm going to say next, <clears throat> has to do with how we, when we speak about these things amongst ourselves, it all makes sense to us because we, we share the same worldview. Sure. share the same philosophical foundations. I'm thinking of I'm going into downtown Columbus um, to the short north or something like that, and I'm going to um, talk to people. I, I, how do I do that? And, and I think the problem is, I, I agree with you, there's a distorted view of freedom, and that, that's at the root of it. But I think even deeper, there's a philosophical problem, and that's what I would call nominalism, that there are no real natures. You spoke of natures, yeah. but... I think the assumption in our society, um, whether it's clearly thought out or not, is that there are no natures, that what we call natures are merely names we impose upon things. And therefore, what all that's left is will, right? Yeah. And so I will this to be, this is the pleasure I want to have, and I will that it be right for me. So when we're dealing with that kind of uh, philosophical error, how do we speak to people? And I, I think, too, at another level, um, when we look at, we make the distinction between natural marriage and sacramental marriage. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the history of natural marriage, we see natural marriage exists under all sorts of different forms. Um, indissolubility often doesn't seem to be really part and parcel of it. Um, I think of the, the Iceland, in Iceland, one of the Icelandic sagas I read, Njal's saga, the fellow just decides to divorce his wife right at a banquet, and he does it. Um, indissolubility doesn't seem to be a part of it. We have polygamy. Uh, when we're talking to people who are of a nominalist bent and who maybe look at the history of marriage and see these idiosyncrasies in it or contradictions to what we're, we're, we're actually developing, how do we speak to them? What do we say? No, I think that's a great question. I, I Chris, I agree with you. It's, and, and in fact, this kind of radical, indeterminate, autonomous view of freedom has its origins in nominalism. Right? So if, if you want to trace back, you know, where, from whence comes this radical vision of freedom that we, that's dominating our culture right now, you trace it back to William of Ockham and nominalism. Right? Because Ockham would, you know, would maintain something so, so ridiculous as it, there are no natures. They're just names of things, right? right. Hence right. nominalism. And, and that God is, is radically free, right? And that it, it's so radically free that he could flip the Ten Commandments inside out. And all those things that are listed as wrong could be right tomorrow if God so decided. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's preposterous. It's, you know, it's bad metaphysics. It's bad philosophy. It's bad everything, right? But the seeds of, of this modern view of freedom are right there, right, in that nominalist movement. So how do, you, how do you speak to a nominalist? Well, I think, you know, if, you're, if you have somebody that's willing to engage, right, and that's, that's one thing, there has to be a willingness to engage. Um, you know, I've found over the years that, you know, I, I only enter into these conversations with people if they really want to have a conversation. You know, I, um, I'll give you, for instance, like I had, uh, this is many years ago, I was in graduate school at the time, I met up with some of my high school friends, and one of them brought a guy along, um, we went out to a, a bar, to have some drinks and get some dinner. One of them, one of my friends brought along a friend of his from, from college. And um, the minute he found out, you know, that I was studying Catholic theology, he was, he started ripping into Catholic teachings, you know, and, and I was okay, you know, so 
at a certain point in the conversation, I said, you know, look, I'm happy to have this conversation, you know, but, but only if this is, you know, uh, a conversation where we're both honest with each other. And I'm honest with you in saying that I have found happiness in living in accord with the church's teachings, because I believe those teachings are themselves from God. Um, and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions that you want. And, and quickly, the conversation took this turn towards the sexual arena, right? Mm -hmm. And in this conversation, this man started talking very quickly about you know, the different sexual encounters he was having with different women. And I said, look, you know, we can talk about these issues. You know, he wanted, he was talking about premarital sex and contraception. And I said, well, I, I'm happy to talk about these issues. But I said, I, I, we need to be honest with each other. I'm honest with you in telling you that I have found happiness in living, living in accord with these teachings. And I want you to be honest with yourself. I have no idea what inspired me to ask this question. But, but I, I said to him, I need you to be honest with yourself. And in these sexual encounters that you just revealed to me, at the end of those encounters, did you feel happy and fulfilled and content? Or did you sit there or lie there in bed and feel like some part of you had died? And his response was, he started to cry. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think somehow we have to get our interlocutors to be honest. You know, to show them that we're willing to engage this con in this conversation with love. And it can't degenerate into some type of shouting match or argument. I mean, we... We have to just stand confidently in the truth. The truth doesn't need me to defend it. Jesus doesn't need me to defend him. What he needs me is for me to present the truth and present him with as much love as I can so that people see how glorious he and the truth is. Mm -hmm. And so when we, somehow we have to engage with, with the, these nominalists on that level to get them you know, to be honest with themselves, to show that we're genuine in what we're bringing to the table. Right? And then you can start asking questions like, okay, well, if you really don't believe there is such a thing as a human nature, Right, that it's just a, a name that we, you know, then what do you and I and this girl sitting next to you and that guy over there, what do we have in common? You know, do we do nothing? Because if you're really serious that there is no such thing as a human nature, then, then we can't talk about any commonalities that any of us have. Mm -hmm. Right. But I do, it's just, it's somehow getting to the, like, really the, the, the root level of honesty in these conversations. And I think that it can only be done, in some ways, it's an appeal to the emotions. Right? Because our culture lives on the, the level of emotion anymore. You know, the, the whole modernism itself, right, was an over-reliance upon reason as opposed to faith. Well, we in the postmodern world, it's postmodern precisely because there's, there's even a, an agnosticism, if you will, regarding reason. Reason can't be trusted either. So you're just left wallowing in emotions, and our culture just emotes all over the place. Okay, well, so let's engage there, right? Mm -hmm. Are you really happy, right? Are you really content? Um, and then to your other question about the idiosyncrasies that they might notice in natural marriage, that, my first inclination to engage with that is, um, you know, as, is to just restate, you know, as a Christian, um, it's, it's revealed to us that God intended this union to be between one man and one woman from the beginning. Now, in all those cultural idiosyncrasies you just mentioned, polygamy, polyandry, you know, all of these, if you will, departures from the norm, what has happened in those cultures? What has been the end result of that type of behavior? Right. And it's never been good, mm -hmm. right? It, it's never, it, there's no, there's not stability. There's, there are always problems. You know, even in, you know, to get back to sacred scripture, you know, you see polygamy and, you know, existing throughout the Old Testament period. Every, but it's clear that monogamy is held up as the norm and the model, right? And every time you see polygamous relationships emerging in, in the, the stories of the patriarchs, beginning with Abraham, there's always dysfunction that results. And that's, that happens on a cultural level. You know, if something other than, than natural marriage as designed by God becomes the norm, the whole society starts to experience dysfunction. Yeah, it's interesting because you, um, if I, I remember reading St. Thomas on this years ago. I think the distinction he makes is that um, polygamy is not unnatural, but it's not according to nature. Right. Yes. And he brings up that point that every time you see it in the Old Testament, it has bad results. Right. Yes. Which which shows that. So maybe what one of the things you're I assume one of the things you're you were doing, um, not in this on a philosophical level when you were speak, speaking to your friend, was you're trying to get him to see his assumptions. Yeah. I wonder if a lot of people don't see their assumptions because I, I, you talk to people. I mean, people in rural Ohio, at least, you, they seem to have a, an innate sense of, that there are natures. Yeah, but, and most people do. 
Yeah, I mean, we're not at, we're not aided by the fact that much of Protestant discourse uh, is based on the notion that th these things are wrong simply because God says so. Right. Right. It's, That's voluntarism. Right. So, which is ultimately uh, Luther was a nominalist. And um, it's rooted in that. So I guess what we're doing, we're trying to get them to see their assumptions and to work up from those assumptions to something else. Yeah, I think that's correct, which you're right. I mean, in a kind of unknowing way, and I think the Holy Spirit was guiding that conversation. That was going, that was what was going on. You know, to, to type of, prompt some type or invite into some type of self-examination or examination of what is the basis for the, your position. Mm -hmm. It seems even we, we Catholics, don't do too well at this marriage business lately. Uh, we're not, uh, to what degree, it's based on sharing the assumptions of society. But um, when I was, when I, w I went to a small Catholic college and I graduated in 1987. And I remember people I knew became, got married from the college and we all had the, we all had the ideal of, of or the, the goal, the, the intention of remaining married till death. But I know a number of my classmates, people who are solid Catholics, uh, who knew the church's teachings, yet have gotten divorced. Yeah. We, we, we see this in, what is going on with Catholics? What is it, um, why is this the sharp decline? Even, not just amongst Sunday Catholics who might not know any better, but even amongst solid Catholics, what's happening? That's an excellent question. I mean, there's, that's that would be a great sociological study, but you know it's and all I can do is kind of postulate my own you know hypotheses. Is um, I think it is again goes back to this concept of freedom that's so it's taken hold in our culture, you know, and it's somehow making a, a permanent commitment is somehow restrictive, right? Of of my freedom, it locks off certain blocks off certain options. Um, and I think you know, the church never exists in a vacuum. You know, the church always exists within a certain within a particular cultural matrix. And I think that you know, Catholics, ha we've we've allowed ourselves to be infected by that contagion of false freedom, and it's just young people are awash in it. You know, it's um, you know, when my grandparents got got married they were world war ii generation catholics and they got married at a very young age you know, they didn't need a marriage preparation phase to tell them what they were getting into mm -hmm. you know, they, they freely committed themselves to each other they knew it was faithful they knew it was for life and they purposefully got married because they wanted to start a family right they knew what marriage was because and it was it was in the air that they breathed at the time mm -hmm. right the air that we breathe now especially po in the post obergefell world there is nothing there is nothing in the air that young people breathe that 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 can give them a sense of what marriage is. It just doesn't exist anymore. So as, as a church, and I mean as a church, not just bishops and priests, but all of us, you know, Catholic parents, all of us need to be very explicit in teaching our children and teaching whoever needs to be taught what marriage is. You know, because if they don't understand it, then sure, it just becomes some type of social contract or piece of paper. And you see multiple celebrities living in that situation. And you know, young people say, well, this is just you know, a formality without understanding that. No, it's not a formality. Right. This, this is this is responding to an innate desire that you have that God has planted in your heart to give yourself away in love to another to image his love for you. Right. So. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer to your question, but it's there. It is true, as you said. There is a declining number of weddings in the Catholic churches over the past ten to twenty years. Kids, young people are just choosing not to get married because they don't see the point in it, mm -hmm. and they don't see the point in it because they really don't understand what it is. Right, and I mean, I mean, it's a deeper question. I mean, it's a deeper problem. It seems to me because so many Catholics don't even know their faith in other areas. Um, you, there, there's been not only a decline in Catholic sense of marriage, but Catholic sense of being Catholic. Well, that's so, true. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're in that situation, the culture does become predominant. The culture does, is, is, is the chief um, influencer. Yeah. It's who's teaching you, right? And if it's, if it's not Jesus, if it's not his church, well, then who is giving you the guidepost for your life? Mm -hmm. Some blog somewhere. 
you know, some internet personality, some TikTok sensation. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get back into this. Let me apologize to listeners because my computer and Christopher knows about this uh, overheats easily. So I'm going to uh, approach the level of rant, which will only make my computer <laughs> overheat more rapidly. Uh, a couple, three or nine points. <laughs> Point number one, thanks for that update on Columbus, Ohio. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, next thought is, I certainly appreciate uh, your wanting, I want the same thing, to bring these discussions that we're having now in, in some uh, uh, preliminary way at least to people who might be interested in them and your your personal story there of the fellow who broke down in tears is, is really remarkable how could anyone forget that at the same time in the public forum in the uh, political life of say a state like california you can pretty well assume that most people don't want to have that kind of conversation. Yeah. And so you could just never address the question. But at the same time, you know public institutions are taking the position that, in fact, marriage is just a social contract, a, con a construct that at most is a social contract contract. Uh, so when you think about uh, the gospel, preach the word in season and out of season. And so it seems to me that in many contexts, we, we simply have to, to take the, the discussion forward, whether we're welcomed or not. And we can pretty much assume that we're not welcomed. But if if, say, you live in California, you know that public education reflects the very opposite of the Catholic view and vision of marriage. And, and, and so you have to engage. Now, it seems to me that at a philosophical level, at a dialectical level, it's fairly easy, fairly easy to... Uh, point to the self-referential problem that sexual libertarians have. Uh, for example, they want to accuse one of being uh, bigoted. Well, you might very well say, well, what is it to be a bigot? And then at some point they'll have to talk about uh, respecting people for what they are. And then you could say, well, what are they? <laughs> what, what in fact are they? Uh, and, and that leads, I think, to uh, its courtesy of moral discourse necessarily uh, involving commitments to natures. It leads to an opportunity to uh, engage an unwilling opponent. And if an opponent is uh, seriously unwilling, the opponent is, I think, in time, uh, just going to leave the field of engagement, which itself is indicative that there's something amiss there. I mean, you're supposed to follow the argument, aren't you? Well, this is what an argument is. It involves a valid form with true premises. That's how you get a sound argument. And the reason why, of course, as Chesterton reminds us, that people quarrel so much is they don't know how to argue. So I think we have to insist in the public square, not every day, every moment of every day, but uh, often enough so that people know who we are, who we are in terms of political uh, positions engage them. Uh, now, I don't think that that was a rant, but <laughs> I, I think there are ways that we can uh, look for the ideal moment, but 
the ideal moment is hard to find in a political context in which the opposition is increasingly entrenched. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. The, and the, the problem is, as you noted, like when you're in, engaged with an interlocutor who really is not willing to engage in legitimate dialogue and legitimate argument um, and is closed off to, to considering, you know, what you're saying. Uh, oftentimes in our contemporary culture, what happens is then the name calling, you know, and this, the, the kind of vitriol that it gets spewed out. Of, well, you're just a hater. And you no, know, I'm not. And you have this conflation in that dialogue of, well, if you disagree with your interlocutor's opinion or their position that somehow you're disrespecting them as a person you know that and um again that's that's because we're living in our culture on a level of emotions in this postmodern world so when i was teaching at ohio dominican you know teaching young um uh, young men and women the one one of the things i said in every one of the classes i taught was um you know we need to understand how to enter into the act into the academic dialogue here Right. Everybody is welcome to express, you know, your position or your opinion. But you have to support it. Right. You have to, that's what, you know, having premises and supporting your argument and arguing to a large logical conclusion. That's what it's about. And if I or anybody else in the classroom disagrees with your opinion, it's not somehow lashing out at you as a person, but it is critiquing and analyzing your argument. Right. But in public discourse and certainly in political discourse, we're we, we've we're far afield from that. I'm, I'm not sure if it can be recovered, you know, um, but on the, on the personal level, on the individual level, I think we can do our part, right? And, and to the extent that any of us have a public voice engaging these ideas in our culture, we just adopt the proper mode of entering into argument. We don't, I am sometimes very concerned, you know, about, you know, conservative politicians or Orthodox Catholics who get in these debates online or whatever, and then it, it does break, degenerate into some type, of, into a quarrel. No, I mean, again, the truth doesn't need me to defend it. Jesus doesn't need me to defend him. All he needs me to do is to present him and his truth in the, in the most beautiful way possible, in a logically coherent way, right? Um, I don't know that I have a definitive answer, you know, to what you're you're saying. It's just, yeah, we, we, you can't you can't you can't adopt the rules of engagement that are currently operative, you know, in politics and in our culture. You have to educate people or bring people along to understand. Look, I, I get another personal example of this: when I was in college. I, I came to know a young woman who was, her mother was uh, an executive in Planned Parenthood. And she came to learn that I was Catholic, right? And um, this conversation arose at a party one evening, you know, and, and, we, and we stayed late into the evening uh, she, she, because it came to, the, she was kind of hurling objections at the Catholic church, you know, and I said to her, um, look, you know, I, again, I'm willing to have this discussion with you. You know, but, I, you know, you understand that, you know, I, I'll try my best, you know, to, to answer the questions you have about church teaching, but you need to know that I hold these dear, right? And nothing I am saying, you know, is, is in an intention of, of offending you, but I want you to come away with this conversation with an understanding of why the church teaches what it does. Whether you believe it or not is between you and the grace of God, but this is, a, this is going to be a conversation about understanding e each other's positions. Because I'm not going to stand here and shout at you. And I don't want you shouting at me. We had the best conversation until two in the morning, right? And, and she said to me at the end, she said, you know, I don't agree with, with you and, and everything the church teaches. But she said, I, I do understand now why, those, why you hold those positions. And I said, that's all I can ask, right? And that's all we can ask, to enter into that type of honest dialogue with people, you know, where you really are talking about ideas, you know, presenting arguments instead of just constantly yelling at each other. Excellent. Christopher, we're getting close to our end here. Do you uh, have some thoughts that you want to share, as they say, knowing that we're happy to hear you out and we think highly of you? <laughs> I don't know how many thoughts I had. I think I've expressed both those thoughts. Um, I wonder if, uh, being that you are dean of dean the ser uh, seminary, uh, if you ever run across, uh, when I read old, sometimes older histories, the 
and even some modern, more modern ones, th there's this basic sense that the Catholic Church upholds celibacy as the highest ideal in virginity, and that there really is hidden in that a, a disdain for marriage. Uh, that the, the celibates hold the highest level. That, you know, it, it, it's when we do call uh, mar uh, the celibate vocation, the vir vocation of vir virginity, a higher vocation than marriage. But how do you get you run across it? Do people challenge you and say, "Well, really, all you really are pushing is virginity, and you and marriage is a sort of concession for the weak." Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in fact, there's. Uh, I'm trying to think, well, I, I can't think of the text right now, but you know, you can see celibacy as a sign of contradiction in some ways. Like, and, and a lot of people outside the church, like, and some people inside the church, look at the celibate life or a consecrated virgin life and say, okay, well, you know, you're hypocrites. You know, you're saying that you know so, that marriage is a good thing, but you know, this is really the good thing, and you're just kind of pushing people. You know, marriage is a second marriage is second class citizenry. But um, now you. you do, we do have to acknowledge that there have been distortions in piety throughout the centuries of the church where that type of thing was happening. Right. You know, where, where you even had in the Middle Ages an encouragement on the part of monks trying to encourage married people to live you know, celibate marriages mm -hmm. you know, because that was the better thing to do. So you or have Saint to acknowledge. Bernard, yeah, or St. Bernard encouraging his brothers to leave their wives. As yes. <laughs> right. So you have to acknowledge those, those distortions when you see them, right? But I'm going to turn to John Paul II in his Theology of the Body to answer this question. He points out that a true understanding of celibacy or consecrated virginity as a higher calling has nothing to do, it implies nothing negative about marriage. Right? And he, he says that it's higher because it's a sign of the eschaton, the, the end times, the resurrected life. When, as Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, we will, we will be neither married nor given in marriage. So in the eschaton, we all exist in union with the one spouse, Jesus. Right? That's the marriage in the, in the end. Marriage is given by God, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, as a sign of that ultimate union. And especially the sacrament of marriage itself, right, as this grace state in which a couple encounters Christ through each other continually through their lives and are called to God by God to a deeper level of holiness by growing in virtue and overcoming vice. Marriage is a sign of that ultimate reality. Okay. But when you experience that ultimate reality, the sign is no longer needed. Right. Now that doesn't mean that you and I will love our spouses any less, you know, than we do now. In fact, we'll love them more, but our love for them will be perfected and subordinated in our love for Christ, who is the one bridegroom. Celibates and consecrated virgins are, are foreshadowing that life. Right? It's a higher in the sense that it, it, it's a sign of, <coughs> excuse me, the resurrected life, a higher mode of existence. Right? So, and the two vocations are perfectly um, compatible and complementary. Right? It's it, just in a, in a brief minute. <coughs> what John Paul II helps us understand is that married people need the witness of consecrated virgins and celibates to remind us that we cannot ultimatize or absolutize our marriages. That our love for each other as spouses has to be subordinated to our love for Christ. Look at Ephesians 5, the way it begins. You know, uh, so mutually subordinate yourselves to each other out of reverence for Christ. Right? And the, the living example of the consecrated virgin or celibate you know, reminds married sp spouses of the, the consecrated aspect of their marriage. Right. They've been consecrated to Christ first in their baptism and secondly in their marital union. And the word consecration is, is apt. Like the, the couple is consecrated to Christ in their marital union. Okay, flip it around. Consecrated virgin and celibates need holy married people, holy married couples, to be a constant reminder to them of the relationship that they've entered into is a nuptial relationship. Right. They cannot live their lives as if they're some type of, you know, old disgruntled bachelor or bitter old biddy, right? That they're in a nuptial relationship with Christ and his church, and they will only find happiness to the extent that they realize that nuptial call. And married couples are a constant reminder to them of that, right? So far from being contradictory or from the church being hypocritical, there are two different calls that are way, different ways, as John Paul II says, of, of realizing oneself as a nuptial gift. 
they go together. Hopefully that was helpful. Christopher, you're muted. <coughs> Thank you. That was helpful. I'm thinking too, uh, the, the, the view about the negative view of marriage held in the past is really is, is overblown. I, I, I'm familiar with a book called Monks on Marriage. I can't remember the name of the author, but it's a, if I can find it, I'll send it. I'll send it. Yeah, to send me a link to it. Yes. Yeah, it's a very good book. And I think it, it shows that the, the, the stereotype of the, neg of, the, of the monastic who is negative about marriage or despises marriage doesn't really meet um, the evidence. And then, of course, St. John Chrysostom's um, homilies, sermons on marriage, I think. No, I, I, I was never the dominant, um, it was never the dominant spirituality or, or in the life of the church. And I think to make the distortions the norm is a disservice. Mm -hmm. But you just have to acknowledge that distortions existed. We're at the end. Uh, as always, we could go another hour or so easily. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for your, your work. And I would think that your courses would be terrific. Looking back, looking back, I finished my senior year, second semester, taking a marriage course, course on marriage, and got married the next week. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a real, a real uh, as you might put it, <laughs> work of providence there. Now, we always end with the, the gospel for today, and this is a gospel that reminds us that God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every kind of filth. Even so, on the outside you appear righteous, but inside you are filled with hypocrisy and evil doing. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the memorials of the righteous, and you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have joined them in shedding the prophets' blood. Thus you bear witness against yourselves that you are the children of those who murdered the prophets. Now fill up what your ancestors measured out. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, very, Godspeed. Godspeed. very enjoyable. Godspeed.